road trips. I've been on many, and one of the great dangers on a road trip is getting lost, and that has happened to me more times than I can count because I do not have a good sense of direction. One very memorable incident happened several years ago when Kent and I were living in Southern California. I applied for a particular church in a rural community. Now, I have to tell you that I am a city girl. I like living in or near big cities. And this church, as I say, it was in a rural community about 75 miles away. And I had heard good things about it, so I just wanted to be open to see if God perhaps would lead me in this direction. So I arranged for an interview, and they asked if I would come at 7 p.m. on a weekday night. And that was a problem because that meant I had to fight Southern California rush hour traffic. But I accepted the uh, appointment and I called up a Google map. This was in the days before GPS. And I thought, okay, I can, I can find this. And I set out. I left them enough time to allow the traffic and that. And really, I did pretty well. I got off the interstate and started down this windy road down the mountain into the valley. I went through lots and lots of farmland and finally came to the town. I found a church, no problem at all. And it was really a good interview. I really liked the church, where they were going, what they wanted for themselves in the future. And as I left the building, I said a short prayer. And I just asked the Lord to give me clarity, that he would let me know clearly if this was the right place for me or not. Well, by the time I left, it was after 9 p.m. at night, and it was pitch black outside. The moon was not out, the stars were not out. And I did find as I went through the town, but when I attempted to retrace my route through the farm community, I got hopelessly lost. I took more long turns than I could remember. Until finally, I was sitting in my car on a dirt road facing a cornfield. I was very frustrated. So I got on my cell phone and I called my husband. And when he got on the phone, I said, I am sitting here in the middle of a cornfield and all I can smell is cow manure. I am sure God was not calling me to this place. <laughs> Well, I finally found my way back to the other state. I saw a light off in the distance, and I just kept driving and winding around until I finally got to civilization. But I knew my answer about that church. It was not the right setting for me. It was not the right community. So today, I'm very thankful for GPS on my cell phone. It has helped me tremendously, even in Pittsburgh. Road trips, most of the time, take us across unfamiliar terrain. And if we take a long turn at some point, we can end up wandering until we find our way back on the right path once again. Well, our story for today is about the wanderings of Israel on their road trip as Moses led them to the Promised Land, this new land that God had prepared for his new nation. And we will see that Israel wandered both literally and metaphorically. Their 40-year road trip through the wilderness is filled with one theme in particular, and that is the people complained. They didn't trust that God would take care of them. They were disobedient. They complained about everything. They complained about the hardships of the trip. They complained about the food. They complained about their leadership. They didn't trust God. Even though they had seen him perform miracles, he had delivered them from slavery in Egypt. He had delivered them from the Egyptian army. But they couldn't even trust God to provide for what they needed to eat. 
God provided manna for them as food. But after a while, they were tired of it and they complained to Moses, Oh, if we only had meat to eat. We remember the fish that we ate in Egypt at no cost. We remember the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. And then Moses did a little complaining for himself as he went before the Lord. Oh God, why have you brought this trouble on your servant? What have I done to displease you that you put the burden of all these people on me? Where can I get meat for all of these people? If this is how you're going to treat me, put me to death right now. It's easy for us to be critical and smile at Israel and at Moses in terms of their complaining, but really aren't we much the same? We forget how much God has done for us. We tend to forget how the good things in our lives come from His hand. And the problem with getting into the habit of complaining is that it blinds us to our blessings. Carol decided that she wanted to do something nice for her next door neighbor. So she baked a pie and she took it over to Mrs. Smith. When Mrs. Smith opened the door, she said, Oh, for me? Thank you so much. You don't know how much I appreciate this. You are so thoughtful. Thank you. The next week, Carol decided to bake another pie. And when she took it over, Mrs. Smith opened the door and said, Oh, thank you so much. You're so fine. The next week, Carol baked again, and she took a pie over, and Mrs. Smith said, Thank you. The following week, Carol baked again, and this time Mrs. Smith said, You're a day late with that pie. <laughs> Carol decided the following week to bake again. Why? I'm not sure. But this time, her neighbor said, Try using a little more sugar, and don't bake it quite as long. The crust has been very dry and hot. And by the way, I would really like a cherry pie instead of apple. Well, the next week, Carol was busy. She was too busy to bake. And when she passed by her neighbor's house on the way to the store, Mrs. Smith looked out the window and said, Where's my pie? It's easy to take our blessings for granted. After we enjoy them for a while, we begin to think we deserve them. Instead of being thankful, we complain. And it's a process that occurs so slowly we aren't even aware of it. But trust me, others around us do notice. It's a lack of gratitude and a lack of trust that lie at the heart of complaining. It's a lack of trust because we don't believe that God has given us everything that we need and we don't believe that He will continue to do that. God asked the people of Israel again and again, do you trust me? Do you trust me to provide food for you? Do you trust me to save you from your enemies? Israel's road trip. So they finally came to the very edge of the promised land, to an area called Kadesh Barnea. And God told Moses to send ten spies into the land to check it out. And when they were returned, they were excited because the land was so abundant. They brought back great clusters of grapes and they brought back figs and pomegranates to show to the people. But eight of the spies said, wait, we can't go into this land. All the people we saw there were of great size. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes and we looked the same to them. Ten men saw the same thing, the great abundance of the land, the size of the people, and only two of them had faith, Joshua and Caleb. They told the people, yes, we can take the land because God is with us. But Israel listened to the naysayers and they started complaining against their leaders. Oh, if only we had died in Egypt. If only we had died in this wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to die by the sword? Talk about wandering. Talk about taking a wrong turn. Here they were on the edge of the land that God had promised. 
promised to them and their ancestors. And they chose to turn away from it. Well, Israel's lack of trust and disobedience to God had consequences. None of that generation were allowed to go into the promised land. The children of that generation were the only ones who were given the opportunity to go into the land that God had promised to them. The Israelites remained in the wilderness for 40 years after that. And finally they returned to the same place. Unfortunately, the new generation had learned that bad habit of complaining and they said, why didn't we die in the desert with all the others? Why did you bring us to this terrible place? It has no water. So God gave Moses specific instructions. He was to speak to a rock, and the rock would pour forth water for the people. But Moses, in his great frustration and anger, struck the rock twice. And water did come out of the rock, but the Lord was not happy with Moses. Because you see, Moses did not honor God with obedience. When we are disobedient, it dishonors God. So consequently, Moses was allowed to see the promised land, but he was not allowed to lead the people into it. So the day finally came when the people were ready, ready to enter into this new land God had prepared for them. All of the Israelites who had rebelled against God some 40 years earlier had died, with the exception of the two that had faith, Caleb and Joshua. The next generation was ready to receive God's promise. And so Moses blessed and anointed Joshua as the next leader of the Israelites. And he instructed the people by giving them commandments for their new life in the promised land. He reminded them of the greatness of God and all that God had done for them. Among Moses' last words to the people is what is called the Shema. And the Shema, Shema is a Hebrew word that means to hear. And this Shema continues to be a centerpiece in the prayers of the Jewish people even today. From Deuteronomy 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. In other words, don't forget. Remember what God has said. And then Moses gave a charge to the people. See, I set before you today life and prosperity, death and destruction. For I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to Him, and keep His commands, His decrees, and His laws. Then you will live and increase, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to possess. This day I call the heavens and the earth as witnesses against you that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life. Choose life so that you and your children may live and that you may love the Lord your God, listen to his voice, and hold fast to him. Friends, just as God was with the Israelites all through their years of wandering, all through their wrong turns, so too he has been with Eula Church throughout our 230 years of history, through all of the ups and downs, through whatever wrong turns and times when it seemed like the church was wandering in the wilderness. We are called to choose life. So on our anniversary weekend, I want us to remember three things as we
we continue forward into the future. The first thing is, our life together is like a road trip. There will be twists and turns, and sometimes we may wander for a while, but God is with us, and He wants to lead us every step of the way. The second thing to remember is that God has a big picture plan, the upper story, as we've been calling it. He knows our destination. He knows the way that we must take to get there. He knows what needs to be developed in terms of our character. God will take us where we need to be. And then finally, remember, we do not travel alone. We journey together as a community of faith. And as we learned last week, we are in a covenant relationship with one another as a church. And that means we are bound together, just as we are bound to God. So, on this anniversary weekend, I leave you with this. Shema, you the church. Choose life. Choose God. Trust Him and obey Him. Amen. <laughs>